welcome him up to the podium. I hope that you will give a warm welcome to the President and CEO of Elanco Animal Health, Mr. Jeff Simmons. Thank you, well done, thanks. Hello, how we doing? Good afternoon. I, you know, I was a little concerned the last time uh, I recall being invited during a meal to speak. It was on a Saturday. It was in South Dakota. I flew in. It was a young sales rep from Elanco and uh, didn't, didn't get all the details of the, the event, but it was actually in a very large um, convention center that, uh, in South Dakota that had a really short metal roof. And uh, as I got there, I learned that there was a rodeo that was going to happen, that there was a country singer that was going to sing at the country rodeo. It was husband-wife event, and it was a Saturday. There was a lot of happy hour before, and uh, the rep says, oh, Jeff, we need you to really do well. These are really important customers. Five, five, 600 people in the room, and I'm getting ready to go up, and just before I go up, they put ribeyes on everybody's plate, and they got out these big knives, and all these cowboy hats went down, and then they said, it's your turn, go ahead. <laughs> I got up on stage, and a hailstorm hit this metal roof. And between the knives, chomping on the plate, and lots of alcohol and lots of fun and excitement about what's about to come, this country singer, and the hail on the roof, I got up and just said, good evening. You do really important work, and uh, you're going to have a lot of fun tonight. And that's about all you want to hear from me. And the place went up into an uproar. Of, it was probably the most, la most applause I ever got, and I just said thank you. So, <laughs> so when I heard, hey, we're going to have lunch, and you're going to speak, I was glad to see it was hamburgers and not ribeyes. So, hey, listen, I, 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 I want to truly provoke a little discussion today. Um, and my goal is I'm not a... I'm not a scientist, I'm not an environmentalist. Uh, there's a lot of people in this room that have a lot more background and experience than I do. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, like many of you, run an organization and a company and do the best we can in a time of a lot of change. Uh, I will say in 33 years in the animal health business, we've seen a lot of chapters in the, in the course of animal agriculture and even on the pet side, we're in 19 species of animals in over 150 countries and we believe in one model, you make animals' lives better, you make life better. And what I, what I wanna say is I, I've got a case here for animals and I think earlier Monica emphasized uh, we gotta be a challenger and I think this, this, this segue is very nice to say how can we be challengers? Uh, what I will say is we're living right now in a world, I don't know about you, but it is very noisy. And the noise can be a problem. And I always say a noise, can you hear the signal? Can you hear what really matters? We've come off from a pandemic. In the animal business, we've had a few other pandemics between bird flu and African swine fever. We've had a social divide, political tension. We now are headed into, oh yeah, we had a war, still have a war going on, and we right now are headed into an economic capital market uh, challenge like maybe never before. And so my one worry is that we don't miss what might be animal agriculture, and if you're in the plant business, the mass majority of your product comes into the animal agriculture, we're the segue to the consumer, I say on the animal side, we don't wanna miss potentially what could be the most crucible 24 months. So I wanna kind of set the case to say, I think animals are the missing piece to what's gonna transpire over the next 24 months, and we need to activate like never before. And I'll start with really this. There's three big issues. You can just hit the headlines, but these three global issues are actually connected by one thing. One of the most material impacts of global food insecurity, the global health situation, and the climate is animals. That's my case. Let's just take each one of them. I just came from Europe last week, our leadership team, to get people to get back in the office and labs. And we're, we're traveling to different continents as a whole leadership team. And we were in Europe, met in our main research facility, and we spread out over all of Europe. Look, they, they're, they're, they've got a serious situation with energy going up three to four times. 
someone with a disposable income, they could actually go from 5 to 10% heating cost to now up to 30% of their disposable income. Food pantry lines are growing significantly, like never before. You, you hear um, economist Jason Luss out of Purdue says, every 1% increase in price of food adds 10 million more to food insecurity. Well, as you all know, with inflation, most consumer good companies on food have raised prices between 6 and 8%. So that's critical. This is the first generation right now, under 25, that is predicted to be worse off than their parents, maybe in the history of this country. And so leaning into this. So food insecurity, and you got three continents, India, some of Latin America, and Africa, that are not getting enough calories. Then you jump over. I spent 10 years as an executive officer representing the animal health business in Eli Lilly. When you look at health care, you know, one in you know, anywhere from one in five or so deaths are related to wrong calories. And we've got a health care situation that's significant, $173 billion that's being spent, and we all know it's not sustainable, especially given where we are today. Um, the White House is actually holding, uh, I think in two days, a conference in the White House all around the linkage between food and nutrition and nutrition's driving force in how we can bring health care into a better state. Um, there's a glimmer of hope here. 24% of people that are seeing this health care situation and consumers are saying, I'm eating more protein. I saw a few hamburgers here without rolls. I could even ask for that. Carbs are down. Animal protein is up. So we play a big role. I say 60% of the world today is either getting not enough calories or is getting the wrong calories. Diabetes needs to be solved by nutrition, not by insulin. So we're, we're a major factor. More than ever, animal protein is a major factor. The other is climate. The political challenge in the room maybe is, you know, is it real? Um, and, and we can uh, challenge, I think, here a little bit to say yes, Surface temperatures maybe more than doubled since 1981. Some of you in this room statistics would say, I don't believe that. Stay with me if you're, if you're an anti-climate person, but just stay with me here because I see it as an opportunity. And there has been an 83% increase in climate disasters. Are they related to all the climate change, the temperature change? That can still be debated, but I think everyone would argue this is becoming a top three agenda for every continent in the world right now. So. Why is this important? I think it comes back to this. Anyone that's come after agriculture, animal agriculture in America, has come after us in a one-dimensional way. And I'll hit the three biggest attacks against us here in just a minute. But here is the slide to remember. You cannot disconnect climate, calories, and choice. You can't. So the first one is the United Nations has been very clear. We've got eight years to slow the rising temperature of the climate, or there will be irreversible, irrevocable damage. And you know what? That one statistic is what's driving environmental movements all over the world, even in places where they really shouldn't have it as a top three agenda. Number two, so we got till the end of the decade. Two is 60%, again, as I said, of the people are not getting the right nutrition. You can't disconnect calories and climate. And if you do, look, people will choose food over temperature. And then the third is a big one, and that is the global consumer is choosing what you actually produce they like. We grew 60 million metric tons over the last 10 years. We're going to see a 50% increase in, our, in growth the next 10 years in meat, milk, dairy products, and fish. So there's no way to disconnect these, and people like to. And they can't. Animals are the connection, and they are the missing piece to this. So let's go through the arguments against us. First is, hey, alternative proteins. Three years ago, I stood in conferences going, hey, is, is Beyond Meat and, uh, and, uh, and uh, McPlant Burger going to replace us? Well, let's just, just let's look at facts, because I know I'm maybe a little bit biased. So the facts are really this. One, it is projected that plant-based protein or alternative protein will only be 1% of total protein by 2027. That's number one. Number two, it will have no impact 
on this eight year window. It will not change anything in the temperature during that time. So take it out of the equation, United Nations, because it won't have an effect. But then as you unpack it, look, consumers are starting to vote here that they don't care for this. The McPlant burger is gone, Beyond Meat is down. Our head of communications just showed me an article that just came out in a major business publication on all the stocks kind of tanking in this sector right now and, and results. There was flat sales in 2021, and they're expected to have flat sales again in 2022. And Duke has just come out with a recent study saying, you know what, actually, animal-based protein is more nutritious than plant-based. And if you think about it a little bit, it's a little bit like uh, you know, vitamin supplements and how they work. You actually get that absorption much more naturally in the body than, than you know, taken by you know, fruits and vegetables and animal protein than you do by a vitamin supplement. So that's the, the alternative protein. It won't, I'm fine with this being a source of protein, but it's not gonna solve the numbers I just shared. The other one is let's reduce herds. I just came from Europe, as I said. Holland has led the, the world by mandating a 30% reduction in animals. The United Nations has asked in the first round of their proposal the just removal of livestock. And uh, you know, the, the answer here is that, first of all, doing that won't impact the temperature. It'll start some food insecurity in the short term. It'll create nutritious issues. But I think the statistic that many don't understand is that 68% of agricultural land in the world is grazing land that produces nothing that humans can consume. And animals are upcyclers and turn that unconsumable human resource into nutrient-dense calories, especially in continents like Africa and all over Canada, the world. So that's not the solution. And I think that I'll go to my last one. And uh, again, Bill Gates, a known leader, a very important leader. Elanco has one of the largest dairy projects in Africa with the Gates Foundation. Spent a lot of time over the last 10 years building a very strong relationship with the Gates Foundation. And that's why it's very important that I see someone that is influential as Bill Gates make sure that he understands what exactly he is saying. He believes the alternative is that rich nations should, should entirely move to synthetic beef. And here's my challenge to him. One is, I don't know what the cost is. As we search the cost, one, can you find it? Is it accessible? And everything from $10,000 a pound to maybe it's coming down. Maybe this is a, a, a solution down the road, long term. It's not going to be in the next 10 years, maybe the next 20 years. It's unsustainable. It's not going to have that impact. And lastly is the Gen Z under 25 generation, a recent study, 72% of them said we're not wanting to move to synthetic beef. So my three points to Bill Gates would be the following. One, meat, animal protein is the hottest food segment the last three years. It's growing faster than any other food segment. As I showed, and it's on this chart, we have grown, the growth has increased 50% the last 10 years. It's expected to grow another 50%. Why? GDP, more, con more countries with more money, animal protein. But the big one, if I ask for a rise of hands to say who in here has been on a protein-based diet, statistics would say that one out of four of you would say that. Keto, Whole30, Atkins. That's something nobody considered five years ago. So... Meat is on demand, and trying to change global consumer demand, Bill Gates, I think that's an opportunity cost we don't want to waste time on. Second is animals upcycle, as I mentioned, and lastly is the big one. Climate neutral farms can happen in this decade. I'm going to show you a couple here in just a minute. Climate neutral farming is a reality that can happen, and that's where we need people like Bill Gates channeling energy, especially now that he's going to be one of the big farmers in America. He ought to get this point, and I think he can become a positive influencer, not a negative one. So in the end, you can't disconnect calories, climate, and consumer choice, and you're not going to be able to try to change the consumer demand. The greatest survey, I say, lots of surveys that can get anyone's point across, but the survey nobody can argue with is global consumer demand. Global consumer demand says what we do matters and is demanded more than any food segment right now, ever. So we got to give consumers what they want, animals what they need. We've got to use less environment in doing that. I kind of say this is a little bit of our research target, and we've got eight years. 
If we don't do the eight years, then uh, you know, some of these alternatives are really wasted time and cost. For many years, as I ever look at surveys done, you see really three things always emerge at the top. Taste, cost, nutrition. I like this brand. I like how it tastes. I like, I've been affiliated with it. It's kind of personal to me. Cost, I can afford it. I can't afford it. I, I might spend a little more money over here on you know, this, but I won't on that. And lastly is looking at the label. Calories, nutrition, fat, these things matter. But there is now a new wild card for animal protein that we've got to pay attention to, and it's choice. And let me just give a couple things. This is the number one reason. Let me just set it up. The number one reason people are not continuing to increase animal protein or have backed away or become a vegetarian is linked to one thing. It's the environment. One in 10 adults who avoid meat think livestock agriculture creates 75% up to 100% of greenhouse gases. Just to note, it's 6% is how much we do, but we get 60 to 70% of the blame. Over the past five years, there's been an increase, 71% rise in online searches for sustainable goods. 72% of consumers are willing to pay more for sustainable brands and 55% of consumers that walk into a grocery store in America have sustainability on their mind. I will tell you right now, we have to pay attention to Gen Zs and millennials. Gen Zs are up to 25 years or so, I'm rounding here on age, and millennials take you up to about 40 years. 66% of Elanco's 10,000 employees are millennials and Gen Zs. They will hold the steering wheel to our agenda the next 10 to 12 years. Why? They might not be the biggest consumers, but they're the biggest influencers of consumers. And here's what they think. 66% again, current food systems destroying the planet. It matters to them. Even though they might not be able to afford all of this, they're influencing this. 52% are willing to sacrifice even taste for the environment. And again, 76% have played around and consumed alternative proteins. But here is what I think is another very powerful slide is, they are looking for the reasons and the solutions on climate. And our simple narrative to them is this, don't, don't try to get rid of us. Cows and livestock can actually be a big part of the solution. Climate neutral farms are possible where we can capture the greenhouse gases that we create and create no footprint. And at the same time, we can help create better nutrition less obesity, less diabetes, feed the world, and help cool the climate by 2030. And that narrative is something that we believe very simply they can grab a hold of. Because this matters, I've, I've been in the antibiotic battles, I've been in you know, E. coli food safety battles, I've never seen something to where the opposite of what they want, we are actually the solution to. And this is the narrative that needs to, be, that needs to become our narrative to this generation. Whether you like it or not, I mean, methane is the opportunity. And that's why we, more than any other industry, maybe more than even electric cars, we can impact by 2030. And so you all know this whole area of, you know, the temperature, the surface of, of, of the earth. They're saying you can, it only can move about a one and a half Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very, very volatile here. But when you look at the two greenhouse gases, you've got carbon dioxide and methane. Carbon dioxide lasts 1,000 years. Methane, as you all know, lasts 12 years. But the big thing on methane is it's got a high potency. It can actually grab in the, the, the heat and show 25% more potency to actually reduce it. So it only takes a little to actually drive it. So if you think about greenhouse gases, methane's about 18%. We're a third of that. But our 6% of the methane contribution, if we reduce in the cattle industry 20 to 30% of the methane, we slow the cooling because of the potency effect. We hold the keys to doing this. And the biggest thing is you never can create movement in an agriculture industry if there isn't money. We can't have subsidies. And there's a way with the carbon market to actually increase economics in farms by as much as 25%. So, and how do we do that? You all know it's uh, very, very common. 
A lot of times when you have problems, we got to innovate and find the solutions. The solutions are already here. It's just the being able to put a plan together to execute on the land, in the animal, out of the animal, and in the value chain. We are tapping in number two, three, and four as a company, Elanco, but there's solutions here. A farm credit is, is investing in, and financing a lot of these solutions, and there's ways to make money in doing them. And I will highlight, I always say, follow the inventors. Thomas Edison and uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin, they, they not only innovated one or two things, they innovated a lot of stuff. So I always go find the inventors. And this, this individual, Mike Mulkowski, I know is a little bit provocative, but he provokes us to the future. He created a $1 billion brand in Fairlife Milk by twice the protein and half the calories. And I took my board of directors and spent two days in, overnight in his hotel in August to his farm. Why? Because climate neutral is close. And today, he's making almost twice the money off from the environment than he is off from milk. And his vision is not only can climate neutral happen, but can also be something that becomes very economically attractive to those that can get there. Now, will it last 20, 30 years in the carbon market? We don't know, but I think this is a catalyst to say there's economic gain if we execute this well. Quickly, just for Milanko, to me, a lot of these talks are great, but if you don't say, how are you personalizing them and activating them, it doesn't matter. Let me share what we're doing as an animal health company. We believe, as I said, making animals' lives better makes life better. On the pet side, we see an aging population with isolation, pets. We see that being a, a big factor of helping that to anxiety in kid, kids, one out of four. Pets playing a role in that. Over on the protein side, Everything from better nutrition, better cognitive skills, less stunting in international countries, to less obesity, to now methane reduction can be one of the biggest areas of opportunity. And we've put a lot of energy to this as really one of our number one top you know, areas, targets in our pipeline. How we're doing this is really pipeline and innovation, analytics, and looking at value creation. Our goal, I'll just get right to the end point, is by next year, helping the dairy and the beef industry be able to monetize the value of their innovation and reducing their footprint over time. So we've got a portfolio that is there. We've got even new stuff like 3NOP that can reduce methane. It's approved in every continent with cattle but the United States right now, but 50% in beef and 30% in dairy. And uh, today our portfolio is about 11% reduction in footprint. That's a new metric I have, is how much does our portfolio reduce the footprint? We have analytics. We have a, uh, a, a model that's Uplook being used on farms across the United States right now that measures greenhouse gas and the levers to reduce it. You need that to be able to aggregate and certify. And we're using Colorado State and a lot of their help too to do this. And then with that data, farms can then certify, aggregate, and monetize. And we've spun out a company that is an independent company called Athean that can actually help farmers get paid for the movement and advocating while doing it. There's others that do this. This is not about Elanco. What it is is trying to show the future can become a reality. So I close by saying, why 24 months? Being around the United Nations closely, sitting at tables with the advocates that are pushing this agenda. They are looking for proof points and policies are coming into play. The Hollands are happening and I believe all of us in this room need to one, know how. They say it takes 10,000 hours to get mastery. It, it takes three nights on the internet and you start to have a whole lot of know-how. And I think you gotta have, we gotta, we gotta be able to understand it ourselves to start to put our own narrative together. It can't be a corporate narrative, it has to be some personal and the only way you get a narrative is if it's actually part of your plans. We've got to innovate, we've got to change regulatory policy in Washington to accelerate. It's got to be economical, you've got to make money at this, and they've got to become action plans. So I opened with this slide that was blurry in the streets of some big city saying we live in a noisy world. But I end with really, I think, vision, and the parable I use with my kids all the time is without vision, you perish. You've got to see your future. In 2030, this is the future I see. I see us changing the game. It's possible. It's already happening. 
We're, we're years away in some operations. I have a vision in 2030 that climate becomes a positive for us. We're a leading pro protein source in the world. Still the hottest food segment is meat, milk, dairy, fish. The world is healthier. There's less obesity. There's less diabetes done by nutrition, again, not insulin. Gen Zs have become one of our loyal base. As 25, as they get to be 35, they get it, that cows and livestock are part of the solution. We've achieved climate neutrality on many farms we're pointing to. And farmers and the industry are capturing a whole nother level of economic value. Farmers are referred to as environmentalists, brand builders, protein source, and helping with health care. That's the vision that isn't, isn't something far off. It's happening. The next 24 months matters. We can't let the noise of today blur the vision of what can be true for the future of animals and American agriculture that's in front of us. I believe animals are the missing piece to the world's biggest problems right now. Thank you. You tell me. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Good. Um, thank you, Jeff. You're always an inspiration on so many levels, and uh, bringing us these challenges today is most welcome. We're going to take about 15 minutes of questions, so if you want to take out your phones again, and we'll collect those via Slido. I want to start out with just yeah. tell us a little bit about one of the things that is most exciting for the, those of us who are in the Kansas City area is your footprint yeah. here in the, in the metropolitan area. Yeah, thank, thank you, and thank you to the Kansas City uh, team that's here, and even uh, the corridor, the animal health corridor, the largest animal health corridor is right here. We're sitting in it. Uh, hundreds of companies and innovators, and a real credit to that and the economic uh, viability here. So, yeah, we've got, uh, we, we purchased Ivy Animal Health in 2007, um, Aratana that's here, uh, Bayer Animal Health was located here, um, and uh, Kindred. So we've four, four acquisitions as well as a natural big footprint. Um, we have a plant right near here that is something really profound in animals is bringing monoclonal antibodies into animals for the first time, and uh, the manufacturing plant will be here as well. So, um, so a, a, a big manufacturing R&D and sales footprint, and our data business, the Uplook, is actually uh, our analytics business, uh, AgSpan, is located here as well. So uh, a big footprint, so it's great to be in Kansas City. Thank you for everyone here that's built a dynamic. I'm constantly saying to Indianapolis, you got to be more like Kansas City, except this weekend. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that sorry. was. A... I'm, I'm really from Western New York. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, so I, <laughs> I had a, I had a bad day too. So, uh, sorry. Was... No, we totally understand. <laughs> um, so, one of the last times you and I were together, yeah. we were talking about the prospects for more innovation in your space, yeah. but the regulatory hurdles. You, you referenced that. One of our yeah. questioners already popped up about what's the approval timeline for NO. Uh, P, three NOP. Yeah. Um, talk to us just about where you are on the regulatory right. pathway. So at a high level, you, you saw COVID vaccine, right? And you saw the acceleration of that. I think I, I start anytime we have a regulatory discussion is to say, hey, it's our job. We're in a very scientific regulatory environment and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be regulated. The bar needs to stay very high for environmental, animal, and human food safety. Efficacy is what can take the most time on a lot of packages, and that's what can drag out for a longer period of time. I sat watching, uh, I was one of five business units in Lilly with diabetes and oncology and dermatology, and then it came to animal health. You're seeing the FDA look at an oncology saying, if it's safe, we'll accelerate Alzheimer's, we'll accelerate it into the marketplace with a conditional approval. And my belief is that we've got, a, as part of this environment, as we're moving from fee conversion claims to footprint claims, or maybe that both, is we need to be able to say, if it's safe in those three areas, we need to look at ways to accelerate innovation. And that's where I'm headed actually uh, tomorrow, is to Washington, is it's really critical that that happens. And if we have an environmental agenda at one part of the government, we need to be able to say, hey, innovation is absolutely critical, and farmers need to be able to make money doing this, so we need to be able to merge both. I think, Sarah, as you and I have talked since even those meetings of six months ago, I think there is a, a lot of attention being given to this. I'm hopeful, but uh, it's going to be very important that 
you know, we have some new constructs and we look at regulatory policy for farmers on the environmental side. They need more options and the technology is there. There are things we can do to reduce methane in the rumen of that cow or even enteric gas in a, in a big way. I, I, this is not one that I'm dreaming, hoping something comes along, it's here. We just need to get it to the market. So let's drill down on that a little bit because yeah. one of the questioners is asking about are you advocating for organized carbon markets for animal yeah. ag and, and you know, how, what does that look like? I'm, 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 a, I'm a four generation farmer um, and uh, my dad's uh, brother kind of in the dairy business and then jumped over and got into the grape business but the farm is the beginning of sustainability and sustainability as Donnie Smith and Tyson used to say, the ex-CEO, it's one word, it's profit. Without profit, sustainability doesn't happen with subsidies. And I believe that I'm not the carbon expert, there's some in the room that probably are, but the value has to be linked back to that farm. And I think one of the things I didn't say in my vision is, I actually think something else that can happen by 2030 is the Nestle's and the CPG companies and ESG that's driving companies like a public company like Elanco and environmental social governance, not, not the SEC, I think ESG, but hey, you suddenly, part of the contribution could be their interdependency on use greater. So I believe the carbon market, carbon credit needs to get back to the farm and the value has to start at the farm and then there can be a linkage then to further in the value chain. We are critical to scope three emissions. And I think farmers can play a role in that. And I would say to all of us, we gotta get educated on this. If you don't, you're gonna get outdone by people that are more educated than us. I imagine you've had quite a few meetings with some of the CPG companies yeah. and just talking about how they're going to manage the scope three and, yeah. you know, and, and, and even the SEC is now involved, yeah. right? And yeah. suggesting that perhaps we're going to have to measure all the way down to the farm. So yeah. uh, there's a lot going I, on. I think, Sarah, too, just to jump on this, I haven't been part of something where all these claims have been made, net zero 2040, right? I mean, you, you all are probably tied to some that are. You might even be like me. We've, we've made claims. When you sit in boardrooms, and I've sat in a lot of them the last 12 months, and ask big companies that we all know, show me your roadmap. And the answer is, yeah, we're working on it. Now, Elanco's working on it. Farmers can be a major contributor to helping, you know, either our processor or our processor CPG company help get there. And uh, the, the example I use with Mike, I mean, there's a lot of big CPG companies that are participating in that value that can be created. They, they're looking for ways to reduce the footprint in a more material way. And methane, look, COP26, everyone stopped talking about carbon last year in Glasgow. Everyone shifted to, this is about methane. If we're gonna solve this thing in eight years, you're not gonna do it with carbon. You mentioned that not everybody is on the carbon and climate bandwagon. Yeah. Um, but how has that changed? It seems to me that a decade ago, we probably had a lot more of, of folks that were doubting and yeah. suggesting that there, there weren't sustainable business models there. Has the tide turned totally? Are you, are you finding welcome uh, entries yeah. from the farmer customers that you have? Uh, yeah, I think so. And I, and I always say when I'm out, you know, even on Wall Street talking to investors, say, hey, I serve the greatest industry ever in animal health veterinarians, farmers, look, they're innovators, they're environmentalists, they're animal well-being. Don't tell me a farmer, the best animal well-being person you're ever gonna find is a farmer. And I think that's the mis big disconnect. But I really think that, you know, we can have a tendency to challenge, you know, maybe, hey, is this real or not? To me, it's here. It's real because perception or not real, money's moving there, the world's moving there, and the Gen Z consumer, like I'm telling Bill Gates, sorry, you can't change global consumption. They love meat and it's growing. We can't tell the Gen Z consumer, hey, the environment doesn't matter. It now matters to them, it matters to investors, it matters, let's, let's, let's turn it into opportunity because we have a key lever here for it. Do, so, you, do you all agree with that? Is that, I mean? Comments? Yeah. We have a couple yeah. of people starting to applaud. Could, no, I can. <laughs> We could do a poll here, how many believe or don't believe, but <laughs> well, the window's open, I think. We can maybe have a Slido question yeah. later and just do yeah. another uh, cloud, word cloud. Um, so a question came in from AgriMarketing, who's here in the audience, wanting to know, just tell us how you divide the percentage of your business, how much is uh, animal uh, livestock and how much is companion animal? 
Yeah, we're just about 50-50 farm animal and pet, and about 55% international and 45% US. Uh, number one in poultry, depending on how you break up confined cattle, um, and uh, aqua, aqua is a big business for us. Salmon, tilapia, shrimp are, are others, so yeah. That's... You've got quite a few of those in Indiana now, right? Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, last question for you that's coming from the audience is just how do we get this story out to more people without cloning Jeff Simmons and sending him to all over the place? Right. Uh, what do we do to get this kind of positive message about animal agriculture out to attract more people to the industry? So many times, over 20 years, I've been saying, hey, we got to all get out and we got to tell the message. My message today is a little different. We need action plans on farms, on companies that support farms. We need, we need to say climate neutral farming can happen. Educating ourselves on how it can happen and start heading down that path, we then come from a position of credibility. And then I think starting to do that, things start to shift. So to me, getting the know-how, getting it into an action plan, and then you, your, your narrative becomes very powerful to be able to say, look what we can do. We go to Washington now saying, hey, we got technology that can reduce the footprint 30 to 50%. We can cool the climate. We only need 30% of the cattle operations in the US in the next five to six years, we can cool the climate. That has leverage. So I would say our narrative, just a, a voice out there, it's going to be very hard to beat the NGOs. But I, I would say an action plan, Sarah, gives us credibility to say this vision and this, this, this picture, it can be a small farm, it can be a, it can be a, a, a pig farm. Uh, creating that gives us influence that we've never had. Thank you, Jeff. It's always Thank a you. pleasure to Thank be you. with you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.